So hi guys, uh, this is uh, as far as I can remember, this is seventy seventh uh, QSTM talk or maybe seventy eighth. I just forgot the number. But uh, today our speaker is Dr. Tarek Kanos from University of Amsterdam, and uh, he's going to speak about towards a microscopic model. Uh, you have just changed the title, towards the microscopic model of ADS fragmentation. And uh, uh, like, thank you Tare for uh, accepting our invitation to give this talk for our forum, which I have started last year and continuing till now. And hopefully I will continue more and more. And uh, Thank you very much for your contribution and uh, we are welcoming you in the QSTM forum. So you can start at your end. Thanks, Ayant. And I yeah, want to say thank you for the uh, opportunity to talk to everybody. And of course, I want to reiterate the, the uh, intention of the whole series that questions are very welcome and Please uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time if anything is uh, confusing. And so, uh, yeah, just so that you feel comfortable with um, keeping it very informal, I will uh, give what I think is a pretty slow paced and pedagogical talk about a problem that I think is very interesting. And it's this, is this, um, idea of the ADS fragmentation instability. So let me tell you just a little bit about what that is. So so the yeah beginning of this talk will be background and then we're going to get into some uh, more uh, refined details. But the first basic picture that I think is uh, something that I want to bring up is that we're going to be talking about a phenomenon that happens in in Einstein-Maxwell theory, just very simple theory of a graviton coupled to uh, a, a gauge field, a U1 gauge field with fixed charge. So the ensemble that we will consider is an ensemble with fixed charge. And it turns out that there is a very interesting instability in this, in, in this ensemble. And this is uh, what is known as the fragmentation instability. And yeah, this, a famous paper that discusses this is this paper by Michelson, Maldasena, and Strominger from 1998. So the idea is that you... One question, why particularly yes. would be, uh, is it valid for any higher dimension or lower dimension, this thing? Uh, the, the fragmentation instability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it exists in, in all sorts of dimensions. In fact, it's... Um, yeah, so the, the paper discusses it in four dimensions, but it's also true in higher dimensions. Okay. And it, it just has to do with, um, yeah, the, the existence of ADS2 throats okay. in models with a gauge field and, um, and fixed charge. Okay. But... Is that, is that uh, clear? You can proceed, yes. Okay, so yeah, so the the following is true. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I can proceed. Oh, yeah. Okay, so so let's uh, let's review just a few facts. First, Einstein Maxwell theory in four dimensions admits a, a very simple set of exact solutions that were discovered. Uh, almost, uh, I guess, in the middle of the last century. And they're, they're constructed as follows. If you take this ansatz uh, for the metric and the uh, gauge field, you, and you, you, uh, you reduce the dependence on space-time to a, co a, a single function h that depends on the transverse coordinates x and not time, then you'll find that the only condition on H is that its uh, spatial Laplacian is zero. And 
the spatial Laplacian of H being zero is very simple to solve. We know that this is, uh, for example, the vacuum Poisson equation from electrodynamics. And the solution is just a harmonic function. So you can write the solution as H is equal to one plus Q over R, where you have a bunch of charges located at positions X to A. Uh, Tarek, why this one factor is coming? Good, yeah, this, so, so the constant one is uh, such that if you take X to be very large, your solution is just Minkowski space. If you, but of course you can see that the equation of motion, the solution is uh, still a solution if you drop the one and that is still a solution to the, these equations. And, uh, but the asymptotics are very different. The large X asymptotics are no longer Minkowski space, but they are ADS2 times S2. Perfect. Yeah. Now, um, yeah, one thing that I wanna mention before moving on is that uh, even though, so let's see if I can um, write. So even though I have written it down, these Qs, these Qs are charges and these X's are positions of the charges. It looks like it's just point charges in a space time, but actually the, at e, the X A's are positions of horizons. They are the locations of horizons. And moreover, uh, we know that when we have point charges, the Laplacian is not exactly zero, but it's actually proportional to Q A times a Delta function at these positions. So really you should think of uh, the right-hand side of this equation of motion being zero almost everywhere, but actually there are sources and these sources are important because otherwise the right-hand side would just be a constant. Okay. So um, now here is, um, here is where the interesting uh, things come in. Is, um, is that at large separation, you can, depending on what kind of solution you have, at large separation, the following two metrics are the same. One is a metric of total charge Q1 and Q2, but the XAs are zero, these XAs over here. So one is where the XAs are zero. And the other is where you have separated these charges into two clusters. And uh, the position of one horizon is at X1 and the other is at X2. From the perspective of very large X, these two metrics are the same, but the metrics differ when you start decreasing X. And uh, the, you start noticing the, the difference between these two metrics at a position around x is equal to x1 minus x2. So what this tells you is that you can have a geometry which is exactly ADS2 times S2, or you can have geometries that flow between ADS2 times S2 at infinity and separate ADS2 times S2s as you decrease x. And uh, yeah, these these two different geometries are, are actually distinguishable from the perspective of a, some dual of this ADS2. They must be because the electrostatic field on the left only has a monopole, uh, yeah, a, like electric monopole contribution. Whereas the electrostatic field on the right has dipoles, quadrupoles, and uh, more, more uh, multipoles for the electrostatic field. So these are actually distinct configurations from the perspective of the, um, from the dual. So uh, you have mentioned something about X of half. What is that? Oh, this is X one or two. It's not oh, X one. one. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, my, my apologies. Yeah, so, so basically what I'm saying is that, uh, sorry, well, what I'm saying is that uh, as you flow into this geometry, 
As you go into this geometry from ADS2 times S2, you can, you, you're in a single ADS2 times S2, but then you have a choice around here and you can branch into the ADS2 times S2 near X1 or the ADS2 times S2 near X2. And uh, those ADS2 times S2s yeah, branch off at around X is equal to X1 minus X2. And yeah, so this tells you that ADS2 times S2 on its own can flow into separate ADS2 times S2. And you can imagine more general situations where instead of uh, having just two charges, you have multiple, and then there are multiple branchings. Excuse me. Yes. Hello. Is X is a radius? X, yeah, X is a, X is a position for a, oh. and, it gi and it gives rise to a, a horizon. Yeah, it's like, okay. uh, but actually, it's the position of the horizon, but really the, the area of the horizon is proportional to the charge Q. So, oh. um, so what I didn't say here is of course, let me, let me just give you a little bit more uh, detail about this geometry. These are uh, exact solutions. So now you, you see that um, it, where the, the charges are and where, what the charges are does not so this does not change the fact that there are static solutions. This should be a little bit surprising because you imagine if you have multiple masses that are in the vicinity of each other, they would attract. And uh, you know, there should be some dynamics to this, uh, to this geometry. But re the reason that this can be a static solution is because these masses are, are exactly equal to their charge. So you have gravitational attraction that is canceled by the repulsion. And so really these Qs are, are to be thought of as both the charge of the black hole and the mass of the black hole. And uh, so the horizon area will be proportional to these charges. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, just I just wanted to mention that, yeah, you can read off the difference between these geometries just by looking at the multiple moments of the electrostatic field. So that tells us that these are like naturally distinct geometries. They're not somehow gauge equivalent or anything like that. Okay, now, there is another piece of information that I would like you to know, and that is that there exists a Euclidean solution to Einstein's equations uh, so no longer a Lorentzian solution, but a Euclidean solution that mediates between these two geometries at uh, minus and plus Euclidean time infinity. And whenever there is a, an instanton like that, a Euclidean instanton, we associate that with, um, with tunneling amplitudes, that there exists a tunneling probability given by this, the action of this instanton that, uh, that tunnels from one configuration with a single black hole to a configuration with two separate black holes. And the action for this tunneling instanton is the difference in the entropies of the two configurations. Okay. So whenever we have a tunneling instanton and, uh, and uh, amplitude, we wanna think about the various states that uh, are mediated between the the two ends of the instanton as uh, two different states in some thermodynamic free energy landscape. So what that suggests is that, um, so what that suggests is that, for example, the single ADS2 uh, with one horizon can be just one state in this landscape. And the existence of, a, of, this, of this Euclidean instanton tells you that there is a, probability to go, sorry, let's uh, make this less fat. There is a probability to go from one minimum over here into another, say over here, with two horizons rather than one. And uh, such, such various pro processes 
uh, or what you see, what the, the instanton is telling you, that you have multi, a landscape of possible solutions and, uh, and uh, they're unstable to, to, to some quantum tunneling between them. So this F is kind of a free energy or something? Yes, this F is a free energy. So it, it seems like very random. Is it like that, the behavior? So the true, yeah, the true one, nobody knows what it looks like. I've drawn it as very random because as I mentioned, uh, one, one single black hole can tunnel into two. Okay. But that also tells you that if you look at the two black holes that are at the end point individually, they, those can tunnel into two more. Okay. And each one can keep tunneling. And each one of those configurations should be thought of as a different free energy minimum. I can understand. So I there are several different uh, configurations that are possible. Once you're in this new minimum, you can tunnel into another one, tunnel into another one. But it's, a, you... it's a crazy type of process. And the, the free energy landscape is... Um, as, if you just look at the general relativity, you would assume that it's a completely random, complex, there's no structure to this landscape. Of course, uh, but during the we know that. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. saying that during the computation, do you have to take any particular form or you just have uh, taken this uh, like some random, you don't need to have taken any particular or specific form of the function, you just can proceed. Yeah, yeah, no, so, um, okay, so good. The, in, in the co computation, the way that it's done is that you work in the, with Euclidean solutions. Mm -hmm. So Euclidean, so the Euclidean black hole solution is a very simple solution, it's like a cigar. Mm -hmm. And then the two black holes are, it's a little bit more complicated, but there is a Euclidean solution like that. Mm -hmm. And all you do is you show that there exists a, a Euclidean uh, solution that on one end of the negative, at uh, Euclidean time is equal to minus infinity, it looks like one cigar. And on the other end, it looks like two. Okay. 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 And, and the Lorentzian interpretation of that is a tunneling. Oh. But the, as far as the Euclidean solution goes is that you just have to uh, show that there exists two solu one solution with these these boundary conditions. Okay, I can understand that. Thank you. Any other questions? Right. So now, given that we have we live in this age where ADS two is being studied uh, in this paradigm of SYK or the Schwartzian mode, these are all words that you may have heard. The question that I would like to ask, and I think is an important question, is how do we accommodate this picture of this fragmentation? Is there a way to understand this fragmentation in the language of the SYK model or, or some Schwartzian uh, paradigm for it? I think that is an important question to ask. And that question, if you, if you follow through on it, begs several sub-questions. One is, what is the order parameter in an SYK type model that distinguishes between the state with one black hole or the state with two black holes? Like how do you distinguish in this effective description uh, between these two states? What is the order parameter? Now, one more thing that I want to mention before we move on is a very important fact, and it's that the separation between the two horizons had no potential. You essentially, if you, if you take two black holes, you can move them closer or farther away from each other, and it preserves the ADS2 symmetry. And whenever, some, whenever you have a free parameter like that, it tells you that you have somehow a marginal operator or, that, or multiple marginal operators, depending on the, the number of horizons that you have. So the question is, is there a way to, is there a model that we can write down that captures, that has an, a possible order parameter for, uh, to distinguish between states that are fragmented or not? And if so, 
does that model have a marginal operator in it? Because if so, then we're starting to get close to understanding uh, a potential dual for this uh, fragmentation story. Is that clear? Yes, I just want to ask one thing. Like, I, yeah. I can understand your motivation, what you exactly want to do. But like, I just want to ask for curiosity or maybe for like future direction or something like that. So like people, the, probably you are pointing towards the usual SYK model, which people have started doing computation, but then later people have like modified it in different, different contexts. Like uh, even Kitaev also complex SYK model. Then people used to talk about even we, we with Shiraz actually written a paper on ON uh, Q tensor model. Okay, so like uh, there are various uh, types of works people have done. So, uh, what is your comment regarding that? That whether this kind of possibilities can be studied or there would be some difficulties or maybe something? Um no, that's a very good question. So yes, there are very man many models um, that uh, that that uh, modify SYK in a, way, in a way. And I think all those models, they are used to describe various different things. Like for example, um, you know, they, all of them have various amounts of preserved symmetry in the IR. And so they describe different physics depending on what model that you're talking about. However, I think none of those models describe this particular uh, gravity phenomenon. And so I think, uh, yeah. And you'll see the model that I'm going to propose is it's not a model that I invented or anything like that. It's a model that's, very, that's been studied in the literature in the past. And it has a feature that to this day is, uh, has not been incorporated in the language of SYK yet. I'll get to it, but I think all I'm all I'm saying is yes. Of course, there are many many generalizations of the SYK model, and uh, I think so far, as far as I am aware, none of them captures this particular instability. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, and I'll 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 of course this is my own opinion. I don't know for sure if the instability that I'm interested in can be described in the way that I uh, would like. However, I'm going to suggest a possibility and uh, I'm actively working towards showing that it may or may not have something to do with this in fragmentation. Still. But I wanted to start with the motivation so that people know where I'm going. It's, uh, it's by no means a closed and shut story. The paper is not out yet. Okay, okay. No, I, I particularly I have asked because when we did this tensor model uh, construction, which was just after the Witten's paper, once the Maldasina and Stanford written the paper and then Witten also written a paper. Then following that work, we did the work. And then after doing the work, Shiraz actually <laughs> not feeling good because we couldn't be able to find out the proper gravity dual from that. Yes. It's very yes. difficult from the tensor model. It's very difficult. So yeah. So that's why I have asked that. Like, if there is any problem to discuss or something like that. So it's it's perfect. No problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, so the model that I'm going to discuss is is not in the tensor model um, equivalence class, but I agree with you that it is very interesting to know, like, to know what those, what the duals of those would be. But you'll see uh, that the reason why those don't have anything in common, or the the particular thing that I'm interested in, you will see uh, why I think it can't be described using tensor models. Okay, no problem. I'm just post process. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's a good question. Are there any other questions before I move on? Okay. So I will um I will give like you know, I will give some background before we move on too much, but 
I want you to know that by the end of this talk, I will try to bring back, bring everything back uh, to some string theoretic constructions so that you see that um, the models that I'm going to propose are not so crazy, or the model that I will propose is not so crazy from a string theoretic perspective. But I mean, this is going to be at the very end of the talk, which is not for a while yet. So uh, just if you, if any of you has, uh, you know, a, some inkling that, uh, you know, th there should be a more microscopic construction for what I'm talking about, then I ask you to please wait until the end of the talk before you ask me about that. Okay, so now we're going to go into a review of a topic that I think is very interesting, and you will see why that this will come up. So what I'm going to talk about are spin glasses, and you might think that they're uh, somewhat unrelated to anything that we would be interested in because we're interested in geometry and gravity, etc. cetera. But, um, but uh, let me just uh, give you some lightning understanding of, of spin glasses so that you can see where we might go in trying to understand uh, potential duals for this for this instability for this fragmentation instability. Okay, so what is this? What is a glass? Before we get into what is a spin glass, let me just tell you what a glass is. So a glass is an object that is structurally rigid. Everybody encounters glass every day. It's on your car door. It's on your uh, mirror. It's it's uh, in your windows. And uh, what is interesting about them is that unlike most other solids or most of, like, for example, metals, the rigidity of a metal comes from the, its lattice structure. It is like a rigid collection of atoms that are, um, that are ordered. On the other hand, a glass, if you look at it under a microscope, you see that there is actually no order in the microscopic structure and there's no lattice. So the rigidity actually is something something that is completely different. It has no, it's the, the source of the rigidity of a glass is not the same as a metal. And uh, actually the reason for this rigidity is that the glasses have a very, very complicated free energy landscape. And what happens is that the dynamic, the dynamics of the glass uh, gets exponentially slow because on it, as the glass is trying to relax thermally to its thermodynamic ground state, it gets trapped in one of these many free energy minima, and it it can't uh, equilib equilibrate to its most uh, natural ground state, its thermodynamically preferred ground state, and it gets trapped. It gets stuck, and this uh, the fact that it gets stuck means that its relaxation dynamics is exponentially slow. So instead of having some rigid structure, the, the rigidity of the glass comes from the fact that it's, uh, it's frustrated or it's, it's trapped in some free energy landscape, unable to find its ground state. This is like a typical feature of a glass. This is what is proposed anyway, as, uh, as the reason for for the slow dynamics or the or the structural rigidity of glasses. Okay, so now what is a spin glass? Well, theorists were interested in this glass problem, but of course, when you have no symmetries, it's very difficult to study the the effects of of your of uh, you know of this uh, type of physics without having a toy model. Like toy models, in general. Are, uh, are constrained by symmetries and they become solvable because of symmetries. So when somebody is told, okay, there is no symmetry in your problem, you basically throw your hands up and you don't really know what to do. But uh, there are a class of toy models that try to get around this and the toy models are called spin glasses. So uh, one way to study the, this problem is to just, for example, as an example of, a, of such a, uh, a model, you look at a collection of spins. So these Sij are spins and they're on some rigid lattice. But now the couplings that couple the different spins can be whatever you want. So the Ising model or the Ising model that uh, 
is very familiar from studying studies of thermodynamics in undergraduate is just where you take this jij to be a constant and only coupling nearest neighbors. But more generally, you can take this jij to be completely random. They can be even, they can change signs. And the more complicated you make JIJ, the more frustrated the system is going to be, and the more difficult it is for the system to actually equilibrate. So, so one way to study this is to consider JIJ completely random. I have a question. And you, uh, yes. Making this coupling parameter to a random coupling is some kind of connection with SYK? It's the same trick that they do in SYK. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. It's the same trick that they do in SYK. And you'll see, uh, you, you're going to see the connections to SYK very soon. Okay. So now, in order, oh, sorry, this, uh, yeah. So in order to, uh, to study this model, you want to compute the free energy. And the free energy is the log of the partition function. So what that means is that you have to be able to compute the partition function as a function of the couplings for any jij, and then you can disorder average the, the couplings. Now that's a very hard problem because you, that means that you need to be able to compute the z in general, and computing z is very hard. So instead what people do is that they do the replica trick. And the replica trick is the following. You just write log z as the nth derivative of z to the n, and then take n to zero. If you, if you do that, then it's very easy to show that those two things are equivalent. But now, here's the trick, is that you, in every step of the calculation, you take n to be an integer. Of course, that makes the analytic continuation to n to zero very complicated. But that's the trick. So, so the trick is to replicate the system n times and keep the, the integer n in the game the entire time. And then at the very end of the calculation, take n to 0. So similar we do uh, during the computation of entanglement entropy. The same. It's the same trick. It's the same trick. Because you want to compute a log. And logs are hard, but polynomials are easy. And uh, one more thing, like I can understand the computing this above mentioned integral directly is complicated, but like uh, even if you apply the replica trick to compute this log z, so what is the distribution function of PG, J, I, J you take? It's kind of Gaussian or something else? Yeah, in general, you can take it to be whatever you want, but most people use Ga the Gaussian. But, you know, for now, we can keep it general. It doesn't matter. It's not important for what I'm about to say. Okay, okay. But yeah, Gaussian, just to, if, if, uh, if you prefer Gaussian, then Gaussian should be in the back of your head. Okay, now, so uh, for integer n, that means that you have cloned your system and, uh, and uh, sorry, this, should, this is a typo. So this should be a B. This should be an A. So, uh, so the replica trick means that you've cloned your system n times, which means that you have a new label for the clone A, which goes from one to n, and your new Hamiltonian is just this J I J S I A S J A, and then when you integrate out the couplings J, what that does is that introduces interactions between a clone A and a clone B. This is what happens in the SYK. During uh, this computation, you have assumed that uh, this JIJ is not dependent on this cloning. Yes, yes. You assume that all of the clones have the same JIJ. Okay, okay. Yes. And this is actually what is done in, in SYK, and this is what is done in spin glasses. Sure. You assume that the JIJ is the same for all the clones. You you clone the system n times, but you, they have the same couplings. And then you take the distribution average over the couplings. And then integrating out those couplings introduces, uh, introduces couplings between the clones. It's a generic feature. 
Now, once you integrate out the, the couplings, you can rewrite your entire uh, theory in terms of a new variable, which is which I'm going to call Q. And the, the Q is a singlet of the the like lattice symmetry, so it's a sum over I, but it will have clone indices or replica indices. And now what something interesting happens when you have uh, no glass phase, which is what happens in in SYK. What happens is that this Q matrix becomes proportional to the Kronecker delta. It doesn't have any replica dependence. So nothing, there's no interesting things that happen between clones. All clones are equivalent and that's called replica symmetry. So when you have replica symmetry or clone symmetry, that means that the system does not form a glass. However, if the, the solution to your model has QAB not proportional to the Kronecker delta, then you say the words that are said is that replica symmetry is spontaneously broken and the system exhibits a glass phase. There is a glass, this is a glass form. And it really depends on your model whether or not the system has a glass phase or not. So SYK does not have a glass phase. And that was initially something that people thought was very useful uh, because um, it made it easier to study and, and gave it more of a potential to have a holographic dual. But there are models where QAB is not proportional to the Kronecker delta in replica space, and they do form glasses. And that is a very interesting feature. And you will see, I'm going to try to relate that to this fragmentation instability. Uh, I have one question before uh, proceed. So here you have actually pointed the two point function, thermal leverage value and mm -hmm. like, but what about the one point function? Is it zero? That's a good question. I'm going to ask that you wait uh, before, I, uh, before I mention that because that'll give some, some intrigue away from the future of the- Yeah, because why I have asked because like uh, in SYK people used to take it zero, that's why. Yeah, yeah, you'll see. That's gonna. That's going to come up. Yeah, and since you were saying that the, you were interested in the glassy phase, well, so my question is whether you will get a different answer or not. Yes, you will see. You will see. Okay, okay. <laughs> it will. It will. If I don't answer that question, but I, I'm a hundred percent sure I will. But if I don't, ask me again. Okay. Uh oh. Sorry, there is no review of SYK, um, but now we're going to get into a different uh, section. And that is that um, I'm going to describe a different model than, um, than SYK, but it's very similar. And uh, I want, I'm going to tell you that it's, it's going to have a lot of uh, features in common with the fragmentation instability that I mentioned before. And it's going to have some of this physics of uh, this uh, glass forming uh, phenomena that I just mentioned in the previous section. Now, of course, this is just conjecture at this point. I have not fully fleshed out the relation between the fragmentation instability and the model I'm about to talk about. I think there's a lot of interesting overlap, but I want you to know that uh, this is, I, I do not know 100% that this is the actual dual of the fragmentation stability. I'm going to give a lot of circumstantial evidence for it though. Okay, so what is the model that I'm going to be discussing? It's very similar to SYK. It's, uh, it's called the quantum P-spin model. And um, it, uh, it was, it's been studied in the glass literature for a long time. And it is exactly like SYK except instead of having fermions, it has bosons. So these sigma i's are bosons. And so the kinetic term is not linear in derivatives, but is quadratic in derivatives. And now remember 
what I was saying in the previous section is that when you have a disordered coupling, you want to take the signs of the coupling to be ra random. They can be plus or minus. And for fermions, if you have a negative directions in the potential energy, that's not a problem because you can just fill the Fermi C and then and then it's totally fine. You can just, there's no problem with having these negative directions. But with bosons, you cannot do that. Everything will want to flow towards negative infinity. So you cannot have any negative directions. So in order to cure that problem in a model of bosons, what you do is you introduce uh, constraint. It's called the spherical constraint. What that means is that you make sure that the bosons live on the surface of a sphere. And so they cannot go to infinitely far away in field space. Now, what that tells you is that this model is actually a sigma model. And these, uh, these fields are actually, um, they live on the surface of a sphere. So what this n corresponds to, is it the radius of the sphere? N is going to be both the number of bosons and the radius of the sphere. Okay. Okay. So, um, so we, so what basically what that means is that we've normalized such that the radius of the sphere is N. And uh, the effect of that means that we cannot canonically normalize our kinetic term to be one half. We need to introduce a dimension parameter, dimension full parameter, which I call M. And uh, that is going to be the signature that we have uh, normalized our sphere in this way. Now, of course, we could have normalized our sphere to different, and we could have made sure to have a canonical normalization. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Like I, either way, how you choose, it's the same physics. So. Uh, all I'm saying is that uh, the, this choice of normalization just comes in to give us this different coupling, which is the, sign, the coupling in front of the kinetic term, rather than the coupling in front of the size of the sphere. Okay? Okay. Now, um, so now that we have that, uh, we can do the disorder averaging. And remember, we want to uh, integrate out the couplings, but we need to compute the log of the partition function, which means we need to do the replica trick. And uh, before I move on, I just want to reiterate that this model, unlike SYK, has two, has two dimensionless parameters rather than just one. SYK just has one. It has this beta j, but... Um, but because we're, we have a sigma model with a new scale, which is the size of the sphere, there's another dimensionless parameter, which is m over beta. And the phases of this model will depend on both of these quantities, not just beta j. OK, so like I mentioned before, we want to compute the disorder average of the log of the partition function. We use the replica trick, which means we replicate our system. We clone our system n times. And, um, and we integrate out this J. And I have introduced a new field. I want you to notice it over here. This new field, I call it Z. And this Z imposes the spherical constraint. So, um, so this Z is going to be important in uh, in making sure that you know we don't have these uh, these runaway directions because this, these sigmas can be uh, on the have to be on the surface of the sphere. Okay, so again, what we do is we introduce this uh, new variable Q, which is like a meson of the O n symmetry of the of this spherical model, uh, but it nevertheless has clone indices is A and B. And once we integrate out the sigmas in our effective action, we're left with an effective action of just Qs. And crucially, there's still the Z. The Z imposes the spherical constraint. And, uh, and the spherical constraint in the language of the Qs just tells you that the diagonal Q at 
zero time separation has to go to one. Okay. So we have a new effective action. This is very much like SYK. This should look very similar to SYK to all of you. The only difference is the existence of this Z and the fact that the time derivative is quadratic rather than linear. But otherwise it looks exactly like SYK. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. Okay. Now, if we look at the equations of motion, they're the following for this Q matrix. And they're again, just like SYK, there uh, you have you have this, uh, this Q to the P times Q. And then what they do in SYK is that they, they assume that Q is proportional to the Kronecker delta in clone space. And once you do that, you get the original equations of motion of SYK. What you do is you drop this term. So you strike it out and then you study this and then that's exactly the equations of motion of SYK. So and in, it has a known conformal solution. In SYK, we used to uh, consider this bilocals as kind of some kind of self energy. So is yes, it so that so that's this that that's uh, this term. This is what it would be called sigma. Yes. Remember in SYK, sigma on shell is equal to Q to the P. Okay. okay. Yes. Q to the P minus one, or, or it's got G to the Q minus one, if you want. That's the self energy. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay. Now, here's the answer to your question, Shayantan. It, it's that. Um, of course, what we do in SYK is we make this assumption that Q is, uh, is proportional to the Kronecker delta. And that, that is, uh, is a self-consistent, correct assumption for SYK. Now, of course, let's go back and understand what this Q is. Remember, I mentioned before, it is the thermodynamic average of our spin degrees of freedom and then disorder averaged. And for two different clones, it turns out that it ha the, you can prove that uh, for two different clones, this average has to equal the product of one point functions in, a, a, in each individual clone. And of course, one point functions are time independent. So these QADs, these off diagonals, have to be time independent and they're proportional to the squares of one point functions. And in SYK, the one point functions are one point functions of fermions and fermions cannot obtain VEVs. They cannot have one point functions. So of course, the off diagonal components of this matrix in clone space will be zero for the SYK model. It's a fermionic model. So it will never have off diagonal components. But for this model, we're dealing with bosons and bosons can obtain one point functions and they will. And in this model, they do. And that is a crucial difference between this model and the SYK model. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. So what is, uh, what is the result of that? So if you study this model in depth, you'll find that actually the true exact solution at low temperatures isn't proportional to the Kronecker delta, but it is of this block diagonal form. So this block diagonal form where you have, um, you have M by M matrices in the block diagonal. So this is M, this is M. So these are M, to, M by M block diagonal matrices. So this is what this parameter I call M is. And then on the diagonal, there's all the time dependence. It's uh, what I'm going to call little q. And so now we have two new, new variables that have appeared in our game. One is the block size m, and the other is q, it is u. So u is telling us that there is non-trivial overlap between 
two different replicas that are close in some, some sense. But then if you go far in replica space, all of a sudden there is no longer an overlap between two different replicas. So it's telling you that there's some kind of structure in replica space. And it's determined by this parameter U, which measures the overlap. Now, if we look at the equations of motion on this subset, then we find this kind of equation. And this kind of equation is already starting to look different from the solution to SYK. Now, the parameters U and M are determined by their own equations of motion. They have, they obtain their own equations of motion. And again, if U is equal to zero, we have the usual SYK solution. Of course, there is a caveat about this uh, U equal to zero solution is that it's not the global minimum of the free energy. Actually, the global free energy minimum is a is a not a conformal solution. The state is actually gapped. But uh, that's an intermediate temperature phenomenon, and we're not going to be so interested in it. We're going to be more interested in the very low temperature phase and the uh, and the spin glass solution. So here so it turns out that if you lower the temperature enough and lower m or sorry, and raise M, then you go from this uh, paramagnetic phase and there is a transition from the paramagnetic phase into the spin glass phase that happens along some non-trivial line in, um, in coupling space. It's drawn here for P equals three. And across that line, you, get, you are forced to consider solutions where U is not equal to zero and M is not equal to one. Oh, one thing I should have mentioned is that in the N to zero limit, remember in the replica trick, we have to take N to zero at the end. In the N to zero limit, what happens is that M, while you think it's a block size of the matrix, M in that continuation has to take values between zero and one. And above the spin glass transition, M is equal to one, but below it has to take non-zero values, non, non values less than one. And the fact that the, that happens signals that you have a spin glass transition. So uh, I have a question, two questions rather. So yes. how to determine the boundary of the first order and second order transition? How is that determined? You have to just solve the equations. You solve the Schringer Dyson equations and you show that the uh, solutions, the, the general solutions start. First of all, you, you see that U equals zero is the only solution that exists at high temperatures. Mm -hmm. as, as you start lowering the solutions, you find that there is a transition where you can start having U not equal to zero. Okay. Now, of course, that's not enough because u equals zero is can still be a solution, but you have to show that the u not equal to zero solution is actually the favored solution, and it is indeed the case. Okay. And my second question was regarding this: the parameter q. This is uh, uh, basically the reparameterization part of SYK, like people used to do. So that uh, the parameter Q is what is called the, is just the two point function. It's what's called G in SYK. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Um, okay. There's no, I haven't talked about reparameterizations yet. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, actually I'm trying to connect every uh, aspect with SYK, each and every point. No, no, of course, that's normal. That's totally normal. This model is uh, seen, it's very close, but it's uh, sufficiently different that it has a yes. kind of interesting. Yes. Okay, so let me, um, let me move on. So the important thing is that once U is not zero, you can expand this Q in terms of what I'm gonna call uh, QR, and I'm going to subtract out this U piece. And it turns out that if you subtract out this U, you'll see 
if you look at the equations, this is something very natural to do. If U is very big that compared to, to the rest of Q, then uh, you can expand around, uh, around that. And you'll find that you kind of get a new SYK type equation. Again. And what's important is that if you do that and you look at the solutions, then there is a very particular dimension to this QR. And that is that it, is, it has a decay, a polynomial decay of power two. That suggests that you have an operator of dimension one. Remember, I mentioned that it is very important for this interpretation from the perspective of the fragmentation story that you should have a marginal operator in your story. And dimension one in quantum mechanics is exactly that. So we've identified a marginal operator. So it's starting to get interesting. And the fact that you have a marginal operator is the result of breaking replica symmetry. Before you broke replica symmetry, there was no marginal operator in the game. Once you've broken replica symmetry, you automatically get one. And I found that very interesting because it's also true of the fragmentation story. Before you fragment, there's no marginal operator. But once you fragment, there is one and it governs the distance between the horizons. I thought, okay, that's something that we, we, should, we should try and understand. I think this is very compelling. Is that clear? Okay. So one thing I one more thing I want to mention is another very interesting thing is that usually in order to determine this parameter M, so this parameter M over here, it comes in the effective action and it has its own equations of motion. So you would solve like DS effective dm is equal to zero. This is something that you want to solve, but uh, it turns out that this conformal solution is not a solution where m satisfies this equation. So that tells you that the, the conformal solution is not an equilibrium solution. You've, you're not satisfying the equilibrium equations of motion. And this is... Uh, actually mentioned in the original papers on this subject, but I don't think they, they, uh, they properly understood what is going on. And actually what is happening is something very interesting. So because M does not satisfy the, the Schwinger Dyson equations, you might think that you would never see this solution. This solution, this conformal solution does not exist then you are allowed to tune M however you want. M becomes its own chemical potential. And you can go through the exact same uh, setup deriving these equations of motion for this model, but now where you explicitly break replica symmetry, which means you introduce clones by hand. They're not just a trick in order to compute the log, but now you actually clone the system and that becomes something physical. And when you do that, M appears out front multiplying beta. Of course, this thing depends on M as well and beta. It's a free energy. And so you see that M becomes its own thermodynamic potential. M is its own thermodynamic potential, just like the temperature. It acts as a fugacity, just like the temperature acts like the fugacity for energy. So once you can, uh, once you go into an ensemble where you can tune M as you like, then this solution becomes accessible. And I find that's also super interesting. Now, what does that tell us? So let me just uh, draw an analogy very quickly. Sorry. 
So the analogy is the following. Normally when we have a thermodynamic ensemble where our effective action is written as beta F, where F is the free energy, we do the thermodynamics as follows. We obtain the temperature by varying that we obtain the thermodynamic energy by varying the free energy with respect to the temperature. We look at like minima, you know, equilibrium processes. And this uh, suggests that the energy is related to the temperature derivative of beta F. And similarly, there is a quantity which we call entropy, which counts the number of thermodynamic states of a particular energy. And it's given by minus the time derivative of the, uh, the minus the temperature derivative of the free energy. Now in our ensemble, M multiplies the uh, out front, this phi is like the analogous free energy. And what happens is that if we take M derivatives, they act like beta derivatives, but where the, the thing that you get on the left-hand side is the free energy. And there is an equivalent entropy-like quantity, sigma, which is called the complexity. And the complexity being non-zero tells you that you're in a system that has a large number of free energy states that are uh, that are growing large. So remember that I drew in the beginning of this talk, a free energy landscape that looked very complicated, F as a function of something, and it looked like crazy. The fact that sigma is non-zero is telling you that you have a crazy free energy landscape all of a sudden. And this is what happens in this model. If you look at the complexity on this solution that uh, is conformal, you find that it actually has a very large number of uh, free energy states counted by this sigma. All right. So the question is, now that we have uh, identified all this very interesting stuff, can we tie the appearance of this, this self-overlap U to the fact that we have uh, developed a non-zero dipole moment over the space of low temperature configurations of black holes? And is this conformal mode, this uh, marginal operator, related to the separation between the horizons. I think it would be very interesting if we can make that kind of connection. Finally, the question that we have to answer is, is this sigma counting something on the in the bulk dual side? Is it telling us somehow that uh, it, once, uh, once we're in this phase, all of a sudden there are all these uh, all these different configurations that exist that are very a very large number of them. And that is why these black holes have the tendency to, um, to fragment. These are all very interesting questions that I would like to answer in the future. Are there any questions before I move on? No, we proceed. Sorry? No, no. Okay. So yeah, just to, to reiterate, I would like to connect all of these things to uh, to the multipole moments and uh, fragmentation. But I want to reiterate that you know we still have a lot of work to do to to make uh, the connection clear. So I, I just want to mention that what I'm doing here is I'm being playful, trying to understand the space of models, what they give, and trying to under, interpret them from the side of a bulk tool. Now, once that we now now that I've mentioned that, let me mention why we started with this model in the first place. So uh, yeah, it seems like my <laughs> my um, uh, table of contents is a little bit behind. We are on section five, relations to string theory. Okay, so at at the end of the day, what I what I uh, have been telling you is that there is a model of bosons. And these bosons have a spherical symmetry. They live on the surface of a sphere and they're disordered. And that gives the uh, physics of 
of these, uh, hopefully gives the physics of these black holes. Now, I want to mention to you some string theoretic constructions that inspired this analogy. And they have, of course, being string theoretic, they have to do with wrapping brains on calabiaus on certain cycles. And when you do that, uh, you have some supersymmetric models. These models uh, can preserve some amount of Susie, and the models that I'm going to be discussing today pre preserve four supersymmetries. And when you have such models, uh, they they can have uh, various types of matter fields, and the fields that I'm going to be interested in are uh, known as chiral multiplets. So chiral multiplets, they are uh, very, you know, they sound a little bit complicated, but uh, they're pretty simple. And all, all you need to know is that they have a bosonic component and it's a super partner psi, it's a fermion. And uh, F is an auxiliary field. So it doesn't have... Uh, I have a question. So yes. why, you, you haven't introduced the D term. So the D term is in the, in the vector multiplet. Yes. So you just and um, consider the, the vector multiplet, of course, is coming along in this story, but I'm going to focus on the chiral multiplet. Ah, okay. But it will play a role. You will see the D term is actually the, uh, is going to play a very uh, crucial role. It's good that you brought it up. Okay. But the fields that I'm interested in are for now going to be the chiral multiplet. Okay. So uh, yeah, so the important thing is that uh, usually these, uh, these, these D brain systems, you know, like for example, if you're familiar with uh, ADS CFT in ADS five, it's dual to a N equals to four uh, super Yang Mills uh, gauge theory, which is a quantum field theory, but there you can, you can arrange your Calabi-Yau and your D brains such that the dual is just a quantum mechanics. You don't have, you can integrate out all of the volume degrees of freedom and you can just be left with the quantum mechanics. Okay, now what is important here is that a supersymmetry, given that you preserve some amount of supersymmetry, it fixes the form of your interaction. There is a, a quantity called the super potential and it's known as W. And uh, it couples, it, it's just a polynomial of your bosonic fields and it couples uh, your fermions in this way. And uh, this W couples to F, it's derivative couples to F. And when you integrate out F, it gives you a potential. V is equal to W prime of phi squared. So that's the potential. Um, once you integrate out F. But here you start seeing, you have a model of fermions and a model of bosons. And uh, you know we know that fermions are like SYK, especially if they have a, um, a conformal mode. So that could be the physics that governs the parent ADS2 times S2. But, but the bosons may govern the, the fragmentation instability. Now, why am I, uh, why did I propose that model to begin with the model previously of the piece bit model with the spherical constraint? Okay, so as I mentioned before, the potential is the derivative of W with respect to phi squared, but there is an additional term that is uh, that was brought up by Shayantan, and it's the D term. The D term actually, uh, tells you that these phi's have to, they, they, ha they have another com contribution to their potential energy. And that that is that they live on the surface of some sphere. So of course, it's not like a delta function, uh, but they are, uh, they want to minimize the potential such that the phi's are very close to this theta, the, their modulus squared. And that's starting to make it feel like the spherical constraint that I was telling you about. These thetas are what are known as Fayette Heliopolis parameters. And, uh, and they're important. So 
you already start to see that in string theory, you uh, you get uh, the spherical constraint naturally arises in these Calabi Almenov. Now, what's more important is that uh, this W, this uh, superpotential, it it couples your chirals in a certain way, but the the way that it couples them is inherited from the compactification, and compactifications can be very complicated. In particular, uh, it, it can couple like different chiral multiple fields in particular ways where you have, for example, cubic interactions are higher, but the coefficients of those cubic interactions can be sufficiently complicated that essentially we can treat them completely like a random disorder. So, so what I'm trying to suggest is that the but bosonic potential for the chiral multiplet scalars in a string theoretic construction starts to look very similar to the bosonic p spin model, where this, this term right here is the disorder. This is the spherical constraint. So, so um, I, I have yes. a, so for this structure of this uh, uh, superpotential, is it necessary to take this a trilinear term? Is it necessary? Yes. Uh, it's not necessarily necessary. So the superpotential can be anything, so long as it's gauge invariant. Okay. And it really depends on the system that you're interested in, but. Many people were interested in this trilinear term because it's the um, lowest order gauge invariant term you can write down. Yes, yes. But it, you can have higher order. You can have quartic, whatever. And that's like P of the P-spin model. So many of the things that I told you didn't, didn't depend on whether P was, uh, it just oh. P had to be greater than three. I, I have asked this question. Those who are interested in the supersymmetry phenomenology they used to take different kinds of super potential. So that's why yes. I have asked this question. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, at the end of the day, um, for my purposes, the fact that it's trilinear doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, mean anything. It can be quadrilinear, any, 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 any uh, potential, just so long as it's gauge invariant and uh, sufficiently complicated. Okay, so all I'm all I'm saying now is the following: is that uh, these string theoretic constructions start looking very similar to the p-spin model, but of course these string theoretic constructions also have the fermions. So it's it you it's a little bit like two in one. You get you get the fermions that are SYK like from this term. And you get the uh, the p spin like terms from this. So what is this term epsilon, which is appearing in the uh, fermionic contribution? Yeah, this epsilon is because these fermions are actually they have a SU two index, and oh. they contract. This contracts the SU two index of the fermion. Okay. Okay. So there is an additional global symmetry. It's not really important for what I'm gonna talk about, but but it's there. I wrote it so that. Uh, um, this equation is correct. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to bring up the fact that Calabia compactifications of string theory are starting to look very much like combinations of SYK with this P spin model. And I think that's very interesting because the duals of these models are supposedly multi-centered black holes in string theory. And uh, if you have multi-centered black holes in string theory, that means that there is a fragmentation instability. And if there's a fragmentation instability, there has to be a way to understand it just from these low energy effective actions. And I think my hope is that uh, by understanding the space of models, we can start to understand that, those features.
Okay. So in conclusion, and uh, we're about one hour and 20 minutes in, so not quite two hours, but uh, not, uh, not uh, so uh, short as to hopefully make everybody uh, feel like I went too quickly. So in conclusion, I talked today about a transition in general relativity that I think is interesting, but of course that transition exists in more complicated models. So I only talked about it in Einstein Maxwell, but it exists in uh, more complicated, e.g. supergravity or other type models. And after that, I discussed what I think is a toy model, a nice toy model that shares the features of this general relativity transition. And I think there's some a lot of work to be done in order to understand if uh, the parameters and the phase space of this toy model really describe the features that I'm talking about. But I think that you know, the picture and the, uh, you know, the analogy is very compelling. As a final remark, uh, I just want to mention that I'm currently trying to understand the four point function and whether or not these models exhibit this type of quantum chaos that people care about so much in the SYK. And uh, we're very close to being able to say yes or no on that. The calculations, just we're just putting them in the computer right now. It's a little bit complicated because of uh, all of these uh, subtleties, but uh, soon I will have an answer about that. And uh, finally, the, these models have a potential to connect to string theoretic models. So I think all of these point to the fact that this model is very interesting. So I hope people are motivated to study such models in the future. That I thank everybody for your attention. Uh, I would just uh, suggest to all the listeners to unmute yourself and give a clap for Tarek for giving such an outstanding uh, talk on this subject. Please unmute yourself and give a clap for him. Now, you can actually ask question and interact with him if you want, or you can actually write email to him regarding this particular questions, whatever he addressed. And those who will going to see it later in YouTube, I would suggest if you have any particular question, please write to him. He will be very happy to address. That would be really great. And thank you, Tarek, for your outstanding contribution for the forum. And it is a very nice talk. And particularly, I have asked so many questions. Hopefully, you haven't feel uh, <laughs> it's too much. No, I was very happy. I'm very happy to receive questions. It's always uh, fun when it's a discussion. I invite anybody to ask questions at any time. And of course, to the viewers on YouTube, if you feel like emailing or uh, asking at any time, please feel free. Yeah, I I, I prefer more questions rather than uh, less. Yeah, actually I was like uh, connected from the starting point because since I did similar kind of work in a different context, so it was like very, uh, I was very curious to know that what is the difference appearing and what is the new, things are coming up so that that's why i have asked many questions and all so yeah, yeah it's great it's great i have enjoyed it particularly and uh, now i would ask the other people i will uh, just stop recording because i have to ask few questions to you so i'm just stop recording